Hi everyone. Uh, today uh, on our third event of the block, uh, blockchain series of IEEE, we will be talking about blockchain in financial services. Uh, for this session, we have the pleasure to have a, a special guest, uh, Paulo Jacinto Rodrigues, uh, uh, and he's going to be talking about the evolution of blockchain solutions from crypto to stable coins to fiat native solutions. Are S the SPDCs the next step or not? So, to give a brief introduction, Paulo Jacinto Rodrigues uh, is the CEO of Public Meeting Corporations, the first fiat native blockchain settlement layer for programmable money. He was previously the CEO of Intellectus EU, Portuguese offices, a blockchain RD uh, centers and global business development manager. Paulo is a seasoned uh, payments professional with over uh, 20 years in the cards and payment industry. During his career, Paul performed roles as head of the Portuguese SWIFT Service Bureau, strategist and product analysis, and head of the Portuguese blockchain DLT banking working group. He's frequently present in several international forums and working groups regarding payments, e-identity e and blockchain. With more than a decade of experience in strategy and sales, management and product development, Paulo has a wide range of expertise in different areas, as well as valuable insights regarding the financial industry and payments infrastructure. Uh, before Paulo starts his, uh, his session, I'm going to say that to everyone that uh, we will be posting uh, a link on the chat uh, as I am speaking right now, uh, that is going to be used for the um, for the questions that you might want to ask Paulo about. So we'll be using Slido for these questions, and uh, I don't know if Paulo wants to be interrupted or not, but he'll tell you in a while. Uh, if not, we'll do the questions in the end of the session. So. Uh, I will be reminding people about this link in case you drop out of the conversation or something. You might lose your chat history, so we'll be posting that link once in a while to refresh it. So, Paul, the stage is yours. So, welcome and uh, thank you. Uh, let me start by thanking you for being here. And uh, I would like to, to tell the audience uh, that the, the stage is yours and you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Nuno, for this brief presentation. It seems I'm I'm getting a bit old <laughs> with all these years. Um, and thank you. First, first and foremost, foremost, thank you to the IEEE team that made this happen. So, as I was discussing previously, it's very important the role that you're you're taking in this in this area to to try and spread the word and and educate people about this, this new technology. Um, I also would like to have a shout out to Ramesh Ramadas, who I had the pleasure to meet, I think it was like three years ago in Brussels, and he was already working for the IEEE and he was pushing the message of blockchain. Uh, I see he's continuing to do his his own efforts in that, in that area, so thank you for, for that also. And uh, I wish all the participants are well in terms of health, uh, taking into consideration all this troubled times we have with coronavirus. Um, and I just, before I, we start, I just want to, to wish you all the best and, and keep safe, you and your families. Uh, let's get started. Uh, the goal for today is to briefly uh, have a discussion on blockchain for financial services. Uh, since it's a video conference, I think the best option would be for me to do the presentation and then we keep the, the, the Q&A answer at the end. It's not that I don't want to have this interactive, but I think for the sake of more being more efficient, I think it works better if I present the first and then we have the Q and A. Um, so the first uh, slide that I would like to just uh, have everyone uh, to keep in mind, and I, obviously I don't know, there's a lot of participants in this session, I don't know exactly where you knowledge, so I will briefly go through through this journey from the basis basics of uh, money to a central bank digital currency which is a hot topic at this point so in terms of money 
uh, sometimes it's difficult to have this conversation because money is so embedded in our culture. We were born with money already. Every, money is something that is present everywhere. And sometimes it's difficult to grasp the different uh, functions of money and to take those parts uh, separately and understand why uh, we came to this point and what can we do from now on. So money, um, as a definition, has three different aspects. It has the aspect of a store of value, it has the aspect of a unit of account and a means of payment. And these three different characteristics uh, are enclosed in one simple thing, which is money uh, in different currencies that we, we know and use every day. So I'm not going to talk about the old forms of money, uh, gold standards or even uh, uh, pieces of artwork or stuff like that. I'm just going to focus on the recent history uh, of money and that that relates to the banknotes and coins that we all know, which is physical money. And we have also paper representations of money and we can think about letters of credit. 1700s, there, there, there are letters of credit in, in the UK recorded in 1700s. You have paper checks that still exist uh, in, in several economies. And these are, these are all uh, paper forms of money that we uh, still use and, and, and still grapple with the difficulties of, of uh, working with paper. And just, just a, an important side note for this uh, slide, none of these different representations of money came to substitute all the others that were be before. These are all cumulative representations which means that at the end of the day, if we find a way to create a new central bank digital currency, that doesn't mean that we're going to stop having banknotes or coins. They might decrease in terms of volume, but there's also this retro compatibility that we need to ensure for all the people that still want to use checks or letters of credit. And, and if, if letter, letters of credit are there, they, they are a piece of value that probably has a date that goes beyond our current date. It might be for, for 200 to 2030, we don't know. So we need to keep all these forms of money uh, um, working together. And, and with time, some of them will cease to exist simply because people cease to use it, not because someone decided that from now on, it's not going to be uh, possible to have more, uh, more, more money on that specific form. Might, it would be difficult to impose that kind of. Uh, uh, so, in terms of digital representation, you have credit cards, you have debit cards, uh, more related to the retail side of, uh, of payments. You have wire transfers in the US or ACH, you have SEPA in Europe, you have other forms of um, payments in different geographies. And, and you also have, and these uh, wire transfers, ACH. SEPA, they are more like, typically more like on the wholesale approach, and but some of them already are available for the end user. When I when I say wholesale and retail, I typically represent uh, uh, represent wholesale as something between a closed loop of banks, central bank and uh, retail banks between themselves, and retail payments as the payments that we are that we know and use on our day to day uh, business. And we also have alternative payments like PayPal, like, like um, Apple Pay, uh, Google Pay. There's a lot of alternative payments um, going on in the, in, the, in the market. But you must realize that these payments are still building on top layers that were built before. So if you say, if you take, for example, Blade, which is a quite successful uh, company in the US, they're using they're, they're putting um, something that it's more like a wholesale form of payment to the end user. And what I mean by that is that Plaid uses underneath the ACH mechanism of banks. So um, there's also an important concept that we need to take into consideration, which is there is this migration between pool payments and push payments. What I mean by pool and push payments? If you think about it in the old days, if I had some businesses with, a, with another person, I would make my make a promise to pay something to another person. And that person would, give, would have some kind of mechanism to go to the bank and push uh, and pull the payment out of my account to him. That concept 
evolved to what we know as a credit card. For example, when I pay with a credit card, I'm not actually transferring money from my account to the destination. What I'm, what I'm doing is giving an authorization for the destination, for the merchant, to come and get money out of my account. So that's, that's a pool payment. And because it's a pool payment, it has a, a risk involved because it takes time between the, the, the point where I say I want to pay and the point where I have the money to be taken out of my account. There's, there's fraud in it, unfortunately. There's a lot of schemes that try to explore, uh, fraud schemes that try to explore the, the pool payment approach. And, and that's honestly uh, the main issue, the mini issue in regards to fees. We all um, are comfortable, uncomfortable with fees on credit cards, but we need to realize that the fees are there um, for a lot of reasons, for, for business development, and nobody works for free, but nevertheless, there is a risk and a fraud item to consider, and that and those fees are there also to cover that fraud. Now, uh, I'm talking about this pool versus pool because when we when we introduce uh, DLT uh, based technology, there's a there's a, a shift in terms of the approach that we have for payments. So these are just push payments. When I have money. And I will use the the loosely term money for for cryptocurrencies on purpose. When I when I have money on my wallet and I want to pay for something, I'm doing a push approach. I'm taking money that is present on my wallet and push it over to the destination. And it's final. There's no chargeback. There's no way to to bring that transaction backwards because I might uh, say that it was me or something like that. If you want to make it uh, pushback, then you need to create another transaction to trigger the funds from the destination back to the origin. But every transaction is on a push approach and every transaction is final. And this is this is something that it's in terms of concept, it's not it's not something new because if you think about wholesale systems between banks, you already have uh, systems like for example target to real time gross settlement systems where every bank or uh, in Europe, have an account on the central bank, on European Central Bank, with funds pre preloaded on each of those accounts, and at the end of the day, they settle between of them, and that and that is a push approach. But that's that was something that that push approach was something that was only available for wholesale wholesale uh, environments because it was costly. There's a lot of technology underneath to make it happen. So if if you think about it, and th those are honestly solutions that create this real-time approach to payment, and they honestly do the same thing as a as a as a as a crypto uh, wallet. The underlying technology is totally different, and we might argue that using DLT it it is more resilient and it is less costly than using a huge infrastructure that is built over the years and has been. Um, incrementally innovating uh, over the years to become what we know as instant payments that are being rolled out in Europe. Now, if you think about cryptocurrencies, well, there, there, first there was Bitcoin, then there was altcoins, colored coins. This is all part of an innovation process. We all know that the technology has been um, going through um, a lot of innovation and maturing, and one of the big steps after Bitcoin was Ethereum, the fact currency, and after Ethereum was stablecoins, the fact that we now have some sort of mechanism that gives us stability um, to do our business. And one of the examples that we typically um, encounter is, for example, if I want to do a enterprise grade solution for supply chain, for example, and I want to um, engage with the financial department of that company that does the the account accounts payable or accounts receivable it's not acceptable for the CMO to um, comply with the tool that gives him a, a way to pay for the invoices in a volatile token because it, it it is not feasible to have to manage a company on top of a feasible uh, on top of a volatile token 
So the stable coins approach was the first step that gave this kind of stability on top of which we can have some, some sort of uh, way to do our day-to-day -day -day business. And on top of stable coins, a huge market that's being rolled out as we speak, the, the DeFi market, the decentralized finance market, solutions that are honestly not disruptive in the sense of concept, because you already have very sophisticated trading mechanisms in the old, uh, on top of the old legacy systems. But the, the big difference is that you now have um, things like yield farming or things like uh, on on chain effects, on chain trade, directly using the blockchain. And this means that these tools or these businesses are being transported from a big, huge legacy uh, system to a new and more agile kind of system. So that's that's the big difference: is to be able to do trade directly with your own funds, even if you're a small investor, instead of going to talk to a trader or to a trading house and go through all the intermediary steps to get to the final business, uh, deal that you want to, to, to do. Now, after stablecoins, and stablecoins, um, please bear in mind that stablecoins are still struggling with a big issue, which is friction. It's not feasible for any of us in this space to invite any, going back to the supply chain example, to invite a, a CFO of a traditional company to uh, use a system where he needs to go to an exchange to buy Ether in order to be able to pay for gas fees because the stablecoin runs on top of Ethereum and it needs to be paid in Ethereum. It's a huge friction and there's a lot of uh, companies in the blockchain space that are struggling, not because they're not, they don't have excellent ideas, but simply because they don't have an easy way to get to mass adoption. They don't have an easy way to remove all this friction of using an intermediary currency like, like for example, Ethereum. Where representations of fiat comes into play. Because when you start to have this conversation with, with the, the responsible of the account payable department and say to him, look, forget about blockchain. Forget about cryptocurrencies. You only need to pay your bills with dollars or with euros, with the mechanisms that you know and are used to. Even if underneath there's a lot of new plumbing that's being used in order to make it more efficient. But when you start to have this conversation with customers saying that if they don't need to change, they just need to use the same tools, then you get to mass adoption. And that's obviously the the tipping point for central banks to start looking into this more seriously. That's why we have a lot of discussion going on uh, all around the world. Uh, there was a recent survey from the International Bank of Settlement, the BIS, uh, saying that 80% uh, of the banks uh, are looking into CBDCs and 50% are already using proofs of concept to understand uh, how to implement this. And, and we will discuss that further on. There's different approaches to CBDCs, wholesale, retail, both. We will discuss that shortly. So where we are today is at the end of this stablecoin era and starting the, the digital representation of, uh, of fiat money. Obviously, this is my, my personal view on this. If you talk about people that are only in the blockchain space, uh, you will find different versions, different views of the world. This is something that I think is the next step, taking into consideration the experience I have working with payment systems in, in the past. But some people also um, believe that all the systems that are after, um, before us, they will simply end and we will start a new era with brand new kinds of, uh, of payment. So I'm going to... Um, get into details of the DLT stablecoins and digital representations and just to draw your attention to something that is currently happening in the market today. So if you look at the crypto market and, the, and all the cryptocurrencies and stablecoins and DeFi and everything around it, you will find that the primary use case has been moving fiat. And, and, and that's why you have stablecoins like Tether and USDC and others, Gemini and others use um, stable coins that are really succeeding because what happens is that people 
are using stable coins to edge um, in order to get some quick uh, profits out of uh, cryptocurrency. And honestly, that's not a good use case if we want to think the long, the long term. If we want to go for uh, enterprise grade solutions, it's not about edging, it's not about the quick return on a, on a crypto that you're going to, to succeed. But nevertheless, if you look, and this is, this is quite old, this is from November last year. Back, back in the day, we already see that the major uh, market was being controlled by, by stable coins. And by the way, on Ethereum. So this is just to say that everyone needs to find a way to use a stable form of currency. Uh, and and, and all, also, everyone needs to find a way to get some kind of a bank account or a payment wallet to be able to transact with people, whether it's right beside you or if or if they are in China or Singapore or elsewhere. So, so what's happening is obviously there are there's this whole discussion about the unbanked people that don't have access to to the bank to bank accounts simply because it's not feasible for a bank for a commercial bank to install branches all over the world. It's they're, they're a business also they. Sometimes it's, it, it doesn't make any sense to open a branch in a remote area. And that's why most of the people are unbanked or because these people don't have a, a good ratio in terms, in terms of a, a reputation. But also there are a lot of companies that are honestly banked. And I mean all the blockchain companies, putting aside all that discussion about the ICOs and all of the, the, the fishy companies that were born a few years ago, taking, um, trying to, to get uh, quick money with the ICOs, but putting aside all that discussion, there are a lot of blockchain, uh, blockchain uh, companies, more inclined to call them fintech companies, that are struggling because they don't have access to a bank account. They are the truly unbanked community right now. And these, these people, these corporate need, need a way to, to find a, a way to have access to fiat. So, uh, uh, Volatility is something that it's very difficult to cope with if you want to develop a business. That's why I keep saying that it makes sense to go back to the whole uh, standard of doing business, which is fiat money. And we can argue that we have other forms of money, but fiat is still uh, one of the more stable um, forms of, of, of money, even without all the quantitative easing and all the inflation in some cases. But overall, I would say that's the best bet. So um, there are two types, of, two types of, you have companies that decided to develop their own blockchain solutions without forms of money in it. And that's a way to uh, avoid a lot of regulation, avoid a lot of uh, legislation and costs to be able to implement your own solution. And one of these, one of the cases is for example, the Hyperledger community. There's a lot of, there's a huge community revolving around the Hyperledger but still they don't use money uh, because it's a simple way of solving the legislation pro uh, problem. On the other side, you have the Ethereum community where they are trying to push the idea of using money underneath their, their corporate solutions. But they struggle with the volatility and, and, and it's difficult for them to get mass adoption as I discussed previously. So if we find a way to have this bank connected fiat underneath for both sides of the of the equation, then you have a way to, to solve the, this issue. And that's where that's where CBDCs, I would say, uh, would play a role, an important role in the next few years. So just before going into the CBDCs, I would just like to give you a brief example, a very interesting example that I came across on LinkedIn from from Kier Finland. Bates, you have the reference underneath. Uh, it's easy to find him. He came up with these four examples just to illustrate the differences between public, private, unpermissioned, and permissioned um, ledgers or blockchains. And and it's I think they are quite um, illustrative of the different scenarios. If you think about the public park, it's completely open and unpermissioned. You can use the swings, you can use the seesaws. Everything is open for everyone. But if you think about the a library, you need to be a member in order to uh, rent a book, to read a book. So there's some level of permission. Although it's a public public space, it's permission. Um, if you have an unpermissioned, but still private environment, 
Uh, if you think about a secret rave party, that would be the best example. There's a pri there's a party going out somewhere. Nobody knows about it, but if you have a, a hint that's going to happen and you appear, you're allowed to get in. So that's an example of a private but still unpermissioned uh, blockchain. And the central banks, it's honestly the private club. You have a private and permissioned environment where everyone knows the others. So every bank knows the, the counterparty. Everyone is KYC in terms of or KYB in this case, know your business. Um, and everyone knows who's dealing with in terms of mitigate, mitigating the, the overall risk of the system. So this comes to the central bank. So what is the what is the purpose of a central bank. A central bank mainly has the role to keep the financial system stable and healthy. So he needs to oversee uh, payment companies, he needs to, over, to, to do the oversight on, on banks to make sure that everything is running smoothly and he may even implement things like interest rate or quantitative easing to, to work the economy in the way that you can uh, increase savings or increase uh, spending. Those are the tools that typically a central bank has on, on its hands to, to make sure the, the, the economy is running um, healthy. And also, it's also important to make sure to avoid uh, um, too much dependence on private companies. And this, these are the examples of Libra or Tether. Uh, not only that, the sovereignty of the currency and this would, would take us to a much much larger larger discussion that I'm just going to briefly uh, talk about, which is if you if you had, for example, a system like Libra running only on dollars, and all of a sudden every European citizen starts to, to use Libra, you have in effect the the European economy running on dollars, just like some emerging markets where instead of having its own currency, they, they operate on top of dollars. So that's, from a central bank perspective, that's a dangerous path to, to go. And that's why every central bank is looking into central bank digital currencies, because it's interesting and also because Libra is triggering this discussion to move much faster. We need to find a way to enable P2P payments for everyone, instant payments for everyone, but still make sure to find a way to keep the sovereignty of every of every state. So there's also another topic that I would like to briefly discuss, which is cash. Cash um, is a legal tender and cash is issued by the central bank. You might see cash also, physical cash, as a contingency plan if everything goes wrong. And let's say for example, all of a sudden there are no payment systems, there is no internet you still have cash. Cash is something that still relies as a, as, a, as a contingency, and that's why it's still supported by central banks. But on the other side of the equation, cash is also a source of fraud, and, and because it's, an, it's anonymous and it's fungible, so, so there's this balance that needs to be found um, in terms of keeping cash in circulation at a minimum, but still in a way that it's, uh, um, a relevant contingency plan if necessary. Now you might argue that some economies in probably in the northern part of Europe, cash is, is absent at all. It doesn't it doesn't exist, but simply because the central banks believe that the the IT systems are reliable enough to be seen as the contingency plan and not uh, paper money as the contingency plan. So there's there's a different angle to cash that I would like to stress out just to make sure that everyone understands the the, the fact that cash has has some value in, in existing in nowadays. Now, for for central banks, um, there are different motivations, and and we've all evolved our solution, our uh, societies with cash, and now there's this opportunity to change cash, and obviously there are different approaches. Um, for all of these approaches, there's a there's a challenge, which is interoperability. Even if China implements in a certain way, Sweden in another way, Marshall Islands in another way, they all need to be interoperable. Just like euros and dollars uh, are interoperable, they need to find a way to, to, to get that interoperability going. But nevertheless, every, every country has its own internal policies. And you might argue that China has a different uh, master plan than the Bahamas. And 
cultures, privacy is more important than others. China might be uh, less relevant uh, in the US or in Europe, it might be the other way around. So all these different uh, aspects of the culture are mapped into a future CBDC. So if you have a plan to have monetary sovereignty and maybe use your currency to, uh, to, use, to use it as a mechanism to influence and to deploy your power over, uh, overseas, then you're trying to push your CBDC to other countries to, to use it. It might be argued that China has that kind of approach. We don't know. Uh, on the other side, you have Sweden, for example, with the eKrona project that exists for a long time already. Uh, it's simply because they don't see value in physical cash. So it's it's just a digital form of money. It, it, the technology was there. It was, avail it was available. Simply that the central bank was comfortable with the fact that we could all And there are other uh, alternatives, you know, other motivations, as you can see in this slide. You have the Bahamas with the sand dollar. Um, some emerging emerging markets they need to have that financial inclusion uh, in order to to prosper, and that's something that it's not really relevant in in more advanced societies. So there won't be a standardized CBDC for all. I'm sure of that. And it might be more wholesale. It might be more retail. We, we will see how that will evolve. So how to, how to move forward as, as a central bank? So central bank, first of all, they, they don't have the capacity of retail banks. They don't have the structure to all of a sudden have thousands and thousands of accounts in, the, in, their, in their ledger. They need the retail layer to broadcast money to the, the, the financial system. So there's this synergies between the central bank and the retail banks and the end customers. And if we were to uh, obliterate the retail banks, it would be a huge uh, uh, investment and a huge set challenge for a central bank to cope with the scalability issue. Uh, and that's something that it's that needs to be taken into consideration when, when discussing a, a central bank digital currency. Um, so, and, and also, um, it's also important you, you, if you put ourselves in a, in, into a central bank shoes, they need to be extremely conservative because the impacts of changing the economy, if you only if you tweak it just a little bit, these impacts can be huge. So I would say that they will continue to be very careful and they will and the evolution will be will take its time. So I'm not I'm, I'm not the one saying that the CBDC will happen in the next two years. I'm saying that it will sure happen in the next decade. Some banks will be faster than others because of their own internal policies, because of the way they work, and, and others will will be slower and laggards simply because they're responding to, to the competition. So for retail payments, this whole discussion was triggered. Uh, slides. Uh, this whole discussion was, was triggered for with with coronavirus and the stimulus package, how to make sure to to get money on on the customer's hands as fast as possible. And if you use the typical approach, the trickle down economy, it is really really difficult to put the money in, into the hands of the end users. So if we had a central bank digital currency where currency would be issued directly from the central bank to the end user, that would obviously support the stimulus package. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why the U.S. has been so so um, interested in moving forward uh, to find a way to 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 get a, some kind of uh, of a digital currency. And obviously, if we have a, a retail digital currency, it would be an alternative to physical cash. So it could it could be deployed in parallel to, a, to physical cash with the same rules, with the same limits. Bear in mind that we, we always say that physical cash gives us an, an anonymity. It's not really anonymity. It's an anonymity up until a certain point, because if you want to deposit more than 5,000 euros or if you want to withdraw, then you need to do some kind of KYC. So there's this um, terminology that was used by a friend of mine a few days ago, which is the, the bubble of uh, anonymity. You have some level of anonymity, but not too much in the sense that you can still control fraud 
at a certain level. But obviously, you all know there are several types of doing fraud, and you can use fraud with small amounts. So, so it's it's a it's a balance. It's always a balance. Um, so this is one of approach is to use a central bank digital currency for retail to help the end users to really mimic the cash, the physical cash. And I would say that you would use the same rules would be trickled down through through the central bank to the retail banks and then to to our digital wallets, to our uh, um, smartphones, interoperate with the ATM machines if necessary. It would be using the same rules as a physical cash. Um, for wholesale uh, payments, uh, there's a whole discussion. Uh, you have a few companies working on this space, but still, as I said in the beginning, uh, you have instant payments in Europe. You have fast payments, uh, faster payments in the UK. Brazil is going to launch the PIX system in November. So these are all um, mechanisms of real-time instant settlement for all. And we could argue that these systems will be expensive to operate because they have huge infrastructures and they are built on top of what was already built before and, and in a sense get some synergies out of that. So for the countries that have instant payments already, the difference in innovation is not that much. Um, and it might be difficult to, argue, to, to justify, create a new whole system for a central bank digital currency. Now that being said, there's a lot of countries around the world that don't have instant settlement and they're using this opportunity to leapfrog and to really uh, use DLP for the next generation of, of real time uh, settlement. So uh, last slide, I just wanted to to give uh, uh, an important note to IEEE because at the end of the day, standards are crucial for the interoperability and are crucial for mass adoption. Uh, we all know that within the SWIFT world, SWIFT, the, the, the company that was owned by banks, or that is owned by banks, had on this, on the mission to push standards because it was simply essential to everyone to have standards. And we, we see that IEEE is really pushing the agenda with a lot of projects uh, on the standardization of blockchain. You have the link here. There's more than 43 active projects on the web page. So, and, and, uh, and there's, for example, uh, Ramesh also works for the Interwork Alliance that recently entered into the Hyperledger community, just like we believe it did. So, so there's this ease in terms of finding solutions, but all built on top of standards. So that's very important to to mention that standards will really unlock the the potential of of, of uh, this technology and, and making it available for for everyone. So that's that's my take. Um, maybe I took I took a little bit longer than I wanted, but now I'm totally available for Q and A. I would like to hear your questions, and it's it it is much more relevant to have an open discussion than just a unilateral PowerPoint deck. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Paul, for, for your presentation. Uh, we have already some questions on Slido. I don't know if people want to put uh, some more questions while we are doing the, while you are answering the ones that are already up. Uh, I might start by, uh, by the, the first one, uh, which asks, uh, or oh, which states, Hyperledger lacks conformance with a specific crypto. If they pursue this path, will their projects never be fully compliant and interoperable? With crypto. So, that, yeah, that relates to the, to the argument that I was saying previously. So Hyperledger honestly has avoided to work with uh, money. So there's a, a huge a ton of projects working with uh, DLT uh, in a way that optimizes business processes. You have Fabric, you have you have a lot of platforms uh, running on Hyperledger, you have Indy for identity, but they typically tend to avoid uh, the crypto issue. Now, the open door is that recently there's a, there was a company from that was born out of consent called um, uh, Pegasus that, that created a platform called Pantheon. 
this was kind of three years ago. This platform evolved into what we now know as Hyperledger Bestly. So that's one of the new building blocks of Hyperledger, which means that Hyperledger Besu is in fact a platform within the Hyperledger community that enables interoperability with the ERC20 token for the Ethereum network. So if you find a way to bridge through Ethereum, you can reach to the community of Hyperledger. And I'll give you an example. For the DeFi community, uh, you have a token called wrapped BTC, double BTC. What that means is a Bitcoin representation wrapped around an Ethereum ERC20 token. So all of a sudden you have within the DeFi uh, environment, smart contracts running WTC, WBTC. So these smart contracts are running something that is pegged to BTC. So I could argue that this same example could be used to wrap and in that sense, you bridge the gap between the more conservative community or more enterprise focused community within the Hyperledger with the community the, that are on the crypto space that typically uh, is completely unconnected with the corporate space. Okay. So, so thank you for the insights on this matter. Um, Let's move on to another question, which I think must be from a Portuguese user, because it says some governments are investing in cryptos, uh, Venezuela's Petro, for instance. What is your perspective on this? Can we foresee a PT coin? Portuguese crypto. Portuguese coin, yes. So local coins are something that already exists for a while. Uh, there are some examples, even in Portugal, of local currencies that were developed kind of like on, on the edge of, of the legal environment to make sure to, uh, to be able to boost the local economy. And if you search the web, you have some, several examples, even in Portugal, where local, local currencies were built. Now, if you say that from that we have a local um, a Portuguese uh, currency, step because we are under the eurozone and 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 if we're going to say that we have our own currency we're, we're not part of the monetary union anymore and that would mean a lot of things uh, by saying that we have your local currency let's not forget that at the end of the day a currency is as stronger as its usage so if you're if you're saying that your currency is going to be strong with 10 million users Okay, but that doesn't relate to the power of a euro that's being used by much more by a much more um, bigger um, society. So, and that's and that's why the dollar is so powerful today. It's because they have this petrol the, the, with the, with Saudi Arabia for a long time, and this gave gave the U.S. the power for everyone to demand uh, dollars. So I would say that the stronger you get is the more broad you get. If you go to a local economy, you start to become smaller and smaller in terms of, in terms of usage. So I would argue that that's not the right path to go. Okay, okay. thank you for the insight again. Uh, talking about money value, we have another question that uh, says that money has the value that people give to it. Gold is not a measure anymore. What are, uh, why are fiat native solutions adoption taking so long if they're not that different from money right now? Correct, fiat is not back to the dollar anymore. That was Nixon's approach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a, a very interesting chess play that he did. And we all operate on top of fiat. We all operate on the trust and on, and on the, the wishful thinking that if we receive salary in this currency, uh, we will be able to go and buy groceries with this same currency. And we trust on that. Otherwise, otherwise uh, the economy wouldn't work. So going back to the to the to the question, why isn't fiat native currencies um, being deployed um, right now? I would say they are, and I would say that it's becoming faster than we think. And, and obviously, 
obviously the coronavirus was a is a, is a awful thing and everyone is being affected by that but it has some good side effects and the good side effect is the fact that for the portuguese community uh, leapfrog 10 years of, of of evolution in terms of being able to have a conference like this everyone uh, in home that that would not be feasible if we think about five uh, months ago and the same happens with with currencies the whole discussion around cbdc's has been triggered with that I, I, we were considering that cbdc's would only be a reality far far away and it become it's becoming much more closer than we think and the same applies to fiat currencies but at the end of the day and talking about the portuguese environment for example we already have well, a, a little step back credit cards credit cards gives the user the illusion that the payment is immediate everyone knows that underneath it's not immediate and mainly the merchants they really know it's not immediate because they only receive the money a few days after and there are charge bags to, to deal with and that's that's but for the end user it seems like it seems like real time that's the beauty of credit cards but credit cards were created 40 years ago and now you have in Portugal the same thing. You have MBWay in Portugal that gives you the illusion that it's instant. But at, at the same time, you have this whole infrastructure lying underneath that is built in a way that gives this user um, uh, illusion that everything is instant. So, so it's what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that if you're going to put yourselves in the end user's perspective, everything seems to be instant. So there's not really innovation in real-time peer-to-peer settlement the big innovation is more into more into the the banking system it's more into the corporate system where all of a sudden the supply chain becomes much more agile so if you think for example in a supply chain you typically need to get from your customers to be willing to, to be able to pay to your providers and there's there's this liquidity issue and sometimes you need to borrow banks to fulfill your liquidity because you're still lacking the payments from your customers and that's a real problem for the economy as a whole now if all of a sudden you get real peer-to-peer -peer payments between entities the payment goes from the end user all the way to the supply chain in less than a day because, well, you might argue that each payment is four seconds for each one. There's a lot of people involved. If you consider that you can do this in a day, that's a huge, a huge advantage um, compared to, current, to the current environment. There was, the, 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 um, there was an example for a colleague of ours from Hope. He was presenting um, a lecture two years ago, and he was saying the example within his own community and his own um, um, uh, industry that he had this situation where goods were being transported from China to the port of Lisbon by a container in a boat and they would arrive before the payment was settled. <laughs> Imagine the number of days that's taking for a payment to get to Lisbon and compare that to... so <laughs> so so that's that's where we stand and that's where the big advantages will will arise. It's for for it's it's for the the real economy, for the corporates, and for the for the the, the banking systems to reap the benefits of that. The end user, well, the private customer, it, it might seem the same thing with a different interface. As long as it's frictionless and easy to use, it won't feel the difference. Maybe in in fees they will feel a little bit, but not too much. Okay, uh, we have some more questions. Another one is uh, a user is stating that a big trend in financial services is transparency. How do you think blockchain can be integrated in this trend? Seems like a challenge. True, because there's transparency on one end, regulation, and on the other end, GDPR and privacy. So, so I don't have an easy answer for that. Uh, it's it's finding the right balance between uh, transparency and privacy because uh, I personally don't believe that we should be totally open. Everyone has the right to to his own private life, and that doesn't mean that you have anything to 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 hide. It's simply because you you want to have that privacy, and maybe that's just a that's something um, 
for our kids or for our grandkids to don't even care about because they were born in a different kind of society. For me, it, it still is relevant to have some privacy and it still is relevant to have some level of anonymity. Now, uh, if you have a world where everything is public, it's, it becomes a world very cruel because you cannot have any mistake. And, and if there's full transparency, like for example, is being foreseen in the, in the China system, you end up with systems where if you do something wrong because you're human, all of a sudden you have a bad rate on your credit mortgage. So it needs to evolve in a very thoughtful way and it needs to, to be uh, thought about very carefully, the balance between privacy and, and transparency. But I believe that everyone should pay their taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh... Uh, talking about payment, payment and costs, we have another question which is related to infrastructures. So, uh, are the infrastructure costs higher than human resources for implementing any kind of the, any of the solutions that you talked about? Or if not, what happens to people? Uh, will they start doing other chores when infrastructures take over human resources? Yeah, that's that, that's the the discussion around, well, it was the same discussion around the, the industrial, industrial revolution. People would argue that they would be taken out of jobs because all of a sudden you have these massive factories that could avoid a lot of people. Uh, I'm optimist in the sense that you, if you put technology uh, on the service, uh, you, can, you can evolve to do much more motivating and much more interesting jobs. Um, and, and it's inevitable for those people that are working uh, in jobs that don't require a lot of thought, that are just the same old, same task, those jobs can be taken out by technology very soon. And that's already, it's going to be a huge discussion, for example, for, for truck drivers in the US, there's a big community of truck drivers in the US. And when you start to, to deploy uh, autonomous vehicles, it will be a challenge for these people to find new jobs but everyone needs to reinvent themselves. Now, um, the cost of infrastructure will inevitably be less costly than the human resource, but our society is made of humans, not, 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 not machines. So I'm not sure if I answered really directly to the question. I'm just, I'm just saying that technology is always good as long as humans are optimistic and, and looking for a new, way, new ways to evolve themselves. Of course, um, I remember the fact that, like 50 years ago, a secretary would take like uh, a morning or an afternoon to write a letter for her boss, for example. Uh, nowadays, they have computers, and suppose you can write like 10 emails or 15 emails or 30 emails in the morning. So productivity has gone higher, but we also are demanding more from people and in different aspects. So I think probably there's going to be a way that people can still keep their jobs, but doing other kind of things. Um, we have one last question, which is not really related to currency, but uh, the question is uh, the following one. Uh, what do you think about the application of blockchain in, edu in education? Do you think we can store our degrees inside the blockchain? Absolutely. That's one of the use cases that makes total sense. And, and that relates to the, to the identity use case. So uh, going back to Hyperledger, you have the indie platform that deals with identity. And within that environment, you have uh, self-sovereign identity. Self-sovereign identity is, imagine that you have a vault not with money, but with attributes of yourself. And only you can access to that vault. Within that vault, you can have attributes that you say you, you have. I could say that I am 25 years old. I'm not, but I could say. And those are self-asserted uh, attributes. But I could have a certified as attribute uh, from, from, from um, IRN in Portugal that states that I am, in fact, 46 years 
level, and that's a certified attribute. And you can have an, a university stating that I have an, a degree, and I could, with my vault, share or not share the attributes to, um, for example, the bank if I want to open a bank account. So, so absolutely. So education, I, I, I digress a little bit to the identity use case, but within the education. Uh, I think it makes total sense for for the for the universities to start building this ledger where you can uh, have uh, um, an assertion of the degree that you have, and that would be uh, very helpful because well within the Portuguese society you have a lot of situations where people fake their 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 uh, attributes in terms of the degrees they have, so that would be a, an excellent use case to start with. Nevertheless. It's always important when you when you discuss a use case to make sure what are the financial incentives, because some of the use cases that you might see relevant in the blockchain space are use cases that can be and should be deployed by the state, and they might not have a real business model. So if you want to start and if you want to really uh, go uh, far with your solution, you have you have to take care of the of the business financial incentives so that the system can grow by itself and not uh, work on a subsidized approach right from the get-go. Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions right now. I, I don't know if anyone wants to post an, uh, a last question to Paulo. Well, while, while, while people are just putting the last question, I'd just like to say that this is the really exciting topic, the CBDC discussion. And I'm sure that within 10 years, we will look back, or at least our kids will look back and will will think how archaic was, was it to receive coins in our pocket to pay for something, or even to have a bunch of plastic cards in our pockets to, to pay for goods. I think we will for sure evolve to a situation where we simply say yes or no to a transaction and that's it. Yes, I, I surely think the same. Uh, I, I would like uh, to thank Paulo for this session and for his answers and the audience for their questions. Uh, I would like also to thank the whole team behind the, the organization of this event. I would like to thank Katarina, Anna Madreira and, and Anna Trick for this. Uh, I'll be posting uh, on the chat uh, right now uh, form so that can uh, it's a it's a little survey about the session so that people can give some feedback and if you wish uh, an attendance certificate you might uh, ask for it in the same survey also uh, we we are going to do these sessions take place every last friday of every month we are going to have a small interruption right now because uh, the on, on july this is on the 31st and it's on a Friday and some people are already on holidays. But we will be resuming the on our sessions in September uh, on a Friday also. So keep on uh, checking. We'll be sending some uh, emails announcing our uh, next sessions uh, when it's time for them. So keep just, uh, oops, let me just, uh, I think someone is saying that the survey is not accessible. Okay, I'll be posting the link. I'm, for on, I'm on it. Okay, just a minute. Okay, so it will be open in a few seconds, I think. So once again, thank you, Katarina, for your support in this session. Uh, I don't know if Paul wants to say any final words. Just keep pushing. Yeah. This is <laughs> This is the new age. Keep pushing forward. Okay, thank you. So, uh, if you wait for a little longer, uh, I will uh, put the, the link down for the survey. I think it's going to be the same. Well, I might I might say well, we're waiting that that the Portuguese community is still very, very small, um, and there are some there. Uh, where we can discuss openly topics. And it's very interesting to have these conversations because sometimes you have, you find people that are totally into the crypto world, uh, very uh, focused on a new age of payments. And there are other people that are totally focused on the 
banking side and you find common ground somewhere in between. So I would, I would urge you all, uh, even if you're not uh, de developing your, your profession around these topics, to participate in these forums because at the end of the day, they are very interesting because you see a lot of different points of view and it opens your mind to, to a new possible uh, better society. So, so I think that's, that's useful also. Well, thank you, Paul, once again. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to meet you all back in September. So see you then. <laughs>